They were joined by Brandon, aka Yangub, an 8-figure dropshipper who scaled stores to $2 million a month. Today we talked about how he made $1 million his first year dropshipping, and then how he made $10 million plus the next year, when to switch from dropshipping to ordering stock, and how the dropshipping scene will change and how you can adapt and keep on scaling. Let's get right into the episode. Hey, what's up, everyone? And after the third try, I'm finally doing the intro for the podcast. Today, we're joined by Brandon. You might might know him as Yengab. Did I pronounce it correctly? Yeah, yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Nice having you on the show, my man. How are you doing? Nice. Uh, th- thank you for having me on the show. Um, I'm doing well. How are you guys? Amazing, amazing. Uh, Brand- Brandon's, uh, Brandon's an e-com legend. He's, uh, he's done multiple uh, seven figures in sales. He's had months where they do two million a month um, scaling brands, not, not just brands specifically with dropshipping, private label, labeling with stock and everything. So, so it's nice having you on a podcast. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yeah, Brandon, maybe before, before like all these numbers and everything, uh, as far as I know, you started in like 2019. Um, and basically in your first year, like you made uh, the first million, which is, which is pretty impressive. Uh, so maybe can you can you take us back to the days when you started? How did you get started? Like, was it just like Googling, you know, how to make money online and stumbling on dropshipping and starting through that? Yeah, so I found out about dropshipping on a forum called Hack Forums. And basically, uh, how, to, how to make money online section of the, the forum. Originally, I mean, when you go on the forums, you see like a sh- tons of stuff on there. There's like freelancing, PDFs, tons of money making method, but um, ended up stumbling over dropshipping, tried it for a bit, failed. And I mean, I saw other people doing it successfully. So I just stuck with it because it seemed like to me at the time, like the most quote unquote legal scalable way to make money online. I was originally doing something else online, but then I was like, it wasn't scalable and it felt way too gray hat for me. And I just didn't know enough stuff. So just went with dropshipping. One thing I, I, I would really want to talk about, I know in 2020, you, you basically had one month where you did $2 million a month. And like you were, uh, you went from kind of like purely dropshipping to taking products in house and kind of like pri- private labeling them, shipping them out from a warehouse. Like, how did you get to that point, first off? Oh, so, so the whole, I mean, that one store that we did, $2 million a month, that was like with one product. I'm mm-hmm. um, sorry, off as a dropshipping store. We, you just scaled it to the point where we're hitting the MOQ. So we're just like, screw it. Like if we're hitting MOQ, might as well just private label it. The capital from that store launched some other yeah. private label stores just like for fun. I think like a whole big part of it, like learning the skills and stuff was just pure trial and error. Like when I was doing like two mils or a million dollars a month, literally experimenting with every kind of ad strategy that I was learning on YouTube to try to take it to the next level even launching private little brands that I would say at the time, like some of them weren't successful at all. Like it was really hard to get off its feet, but like I took the risk anyways and I learned a lot from it. We had, we had an interesting client that, that we work with. They're kind of like a private equity company. When they took one product, instead of just creating one store, they created multiple stores and it's kind of like targeting the same audience, but they're, they're attacking the audience from different angles. And it also kind of like, it gives us false perception, kind of like similar to what Ray-Ban does, with their sunglasses, it's like uh, like all the Ray-Ban glasses, everything is owned by Luxottica, right? That's one company, they create different brands. When you were scaling those $2 million months, was it just with one store or were you kind of like diversifying that? Um, I mean, I diversified it because of like Facebook bands and stuff. Yeah. But that was like the only reason why I diversified. <laughs> but like when I would like Google Trends search, like the, the store and the product, like all of my stores would show up on like the Google trends. So for you, when you were doing, when you were scaling to multi seven figures a month, uh, like one thing I'm curious about, like how, what was your team? Were you like doing everything like, you know, pretty much yourself or did you have a team built out with you or was it just VAs? It, like it was literally just VAs. Like it was, it's funny enough, like you'll think like you need a big team to like do like insane revenue, but like you, it could literally just be like yourself and like a team of VAs, at least on like the e-com side, uh, I would say like, yeah, it, it was just like, you just need the payment processing logistics and then the customer service. But we, we pr- pretty much just scaled up to eight figures that year with literally just me doing the ads, the marketing, um, editing the videos, copywriting, everything pretty much. 
other than the payment processing. And that was literally it. Oh, and, and the customer service. Of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, that's that's pretty interesting. One one trend we're seeing more and more often right now that we we see more of these kind of like human unicorns per se, where you have someone who's who knows a bunch of different skills and they can execute them very very well, and they can really scale businesses, dive deep, and and yeah, that, that's interesting to see. Looking back, if you had to do it all again with the knowledge and skills you have right now, like right now you're running ecom incubator with with Gem. Um, uh, would you would you do things differently in, same, in terms of team structure? Like, would you change things or would you keep it the same structure as you had previously? If there was like a side of the, the team that I'm invested in, it would probably be like a, the creative side. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, I would just, and maybe hire managers, I'll train them to a certain standard. So I'll probably do that in-house just because like the return of that, like just paying someone like even $30 an hour isn't that much over like a year. The return on that is like, pretty good because then it's like one thing to make money and then there's like another thing to like retain it mm-hmm. uh, yeah for this store i'm curious like what would you say would be the most important aspect for why it became so successful was it like a crazy building product was it like very good like media buying strategies or was it like what, what's the reason you think what made this store so successful in such a so- short period of time definitely not the media buying strategy i would say like big part of it's the product for sure at the time um yeah definitely not the media buying strategy there's like the product the creative and then the offer wasn't really a big part of it there wasn't anything like crazy about it so yeah the product was a huge part and then just be creative at the time just mm-hmm. everything at the right market fit and there was a product i'm pretty sure you guys have already revealed revealed the product right am i right um not really no okay then i'm uh mistaken something all good all good so basically it's like a crazy good winning product quick qu- question question in regards to this like i want to i want to take a step back and t- uh, and talk about creatives because like right now yeah yesterday we had a we had a, a conversation with jordan menard from motif digital what he talked about is like right now all the time they're, they're pretty much creating a- creatives in-house where previously we saw a lot of for example agencies in the dtc space they would just go in a brand as the brand to maybe like send them some creatives with barely any guidance and just scale them with their media buying skills. Like right now, especially with TikTok, we see creative more, be more important. Back then, were you kind of like borrowing creatives of the internet or did you create your own custom content? I'm bored like initially when I was testing, but then transitioning to 2020, we, we would, yeah, just do it. Like we will get custom creative. So we will hire like an agency to do it, but mm got really expensive and then for myself I'm like a I would say like I'm a pretty creative person myself so then I just learn how to do the creatives myself and then just record creatives with my friends and if if I needed like extra clips that, that I couldn't record I'll just hire the agency to do it yeah 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 now now I mean like right now from from 2019 2020 to 2022 dropshipping game is different and right now with gem as i previously mentioned you run ecom incubator you're working with with a bunch of people like people who are starting out and also have a lot a lot of people who already have experience who are scaling um and who just want to kind of like scale beyond you know that 50 30k 100k a month so on and so forth um what's what are the kind of big differences you see within dropshipping right now like 2019 2020 versus right now 2022 going you know into q2 and later q3 i would just say the the standard that you just do things to the the speed of execution volume volume of execution still remains the same especially if you're draw shipping the whole game comes down to like testing testing always even like even if you're not draw, draw shipping you're always testing reiterating and i think that's like the whole key but like just the standard you do everything to um, right. Making sure you have a, a process. So like initially you want to test for like, you just want to dip your toes into the water, like, or, or at least in like the media buying and um, making sure your initial test is gives you useful insight. Sorry, my Slack is like going off. <laughs> no worries. No worries. No. By the way, when, when you talk about tests, is that specifically product testing or creative testing or both? how most people are like aware of like how to test products is like they'll throw like ads up on Facebook with like 10 single interests. But then when you're testing like that, it doesn't really give you like any useful insights. So you're not really leveraging much of like your 
your marketing abilities or like it's not like a I feel like it's an expensive test to do if you're doing like single interest um how I like to test now and this is just like it took me like forever to learn this but like this is just how like and it's not something I originated it's just like how you do like the media buying stuff is like initially you want to test with like angles and the message and the different creative angles um so like you would maintain like the same like you know do your product test the same way you would just like approach it differently in, in the media buying end and just i'm not sure like the word for it or like how to explain it but so so it's, it's it's kind of it's kind of like start start starting with different angles. Where, for example, as yesterday we kind of talked about uh, with Jordan, what he said, what what they typically do is when they run tests. In their case, uh, they're working with larger budgets and they're working with proven products. So for them, they typically do creative testing. It's kind of like they they pick an angle at an asset level. So for example, let's say it's it's uh, uh, you know knee pain, and then their whole creative the ad copy the the the, uh, the creative itself would be around that angle. So I'm guessing it's kind of like 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 what you're talking about as well so it that's exactly it so like i would set like a up like a cbo campaign each ad set is an angle and then each mm -hmm. creative correlates like with that angle and then gotcha. and just like cbo is optimized for lowest costs right gotcha so, so you're so you're on testing with cbo's instead of abo's I'm, I'm testing with cbo's only time i'll use abo is if i need to isolate the spend gotcha Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. So, so you're kind of like giving, giving all the power to Facebook, let them figure out what, what would work. So, so, so at that point, like if you are, for example, testing a product, how many, how many angles would you test? Is it kind of like, you know, uh, I remember Tim Bird back in the day, he had the three, eight, eight method where it's yeah. three campaigns, eight, uh, like four ad sets duplicated and four creatives duplicated. Like, like how much angles do you test? If I'm selling like a, sorry, a, a dog barking sciencing device, one angle could be um, to stop your neighbor's dog from barking. One angle could be stop your own dog from barking. And then I'll do like maybe an, an even an experimental angle. The whole key is just to like test and then like give yourself like as much freedom as possible. And just for me, I trust right. Facebook a lot. So I'm going to be right. testing a lot. And like if I'm not getting spend on certain angle or certain ad, I'm just going to be like, okay, like this doesn't work. Right, right. Is is there sometimes when you're not getting spend, do you do you isolate it and try to try to like isolate it in an ABO where like you might think this angle should work? Uh, do you do do you ever do that? I I've done that before because I'm like, like I swear this would work, but every single time I'm always like, okay, like Facebook is pretty right. on the ball of like why they're not spending there. Even like in the placements, like okay, like this placement is like has like ten rules. I'm gonna isolate it. Always turns out Facebook knows like what's going on. In terms of products, like what are some trends you see in ter in terms of products that that's selling? I mean, like right now we work with a lot of European uh, like European dropshippers. For them, we see they sell a lot of products you would see in the U.S. like 2018, like these very very like low quality products with poor landing pages. It looks awful. And versus like with our clients we work with who do dropshipping, we see typically people like maybe try to make more branded pages and whatnot. Like, I mean, you do access to, you have access to a lot of data with this, like with your students and whatnot. And like you were doing e-com dropshipping previously. What are kind of like some trends you're seeing right now we're going into? Um, I see like, dude, across the board as well, like shitty, even in the United States, like really shitty image ads, plus a really crappy product page converting. And I'm just like, mm. I'm, I'm like, wow, like I couldn't believe it, but like hats off to you for like the speed of execution it just works but obviously like as you try to scale that you're going to hit like a revenue ceiling so you have like optimize everything but like just to get something to work you don't need anything like too overboard what would you look into with like what would you look to find like a, a winning dropshipping product like i mean ad spy was a huge thing just trying to you know spy on competitors and whatnot um what do you see as kind of like the main strategies right now I suggest people just use like Facebook ads. I research up phrases, problems, even like the niche itself, just literally reverse engineer for me, especially when I'm like doing anything marketing related, like everything I do is just off reverse engineering. And maybe like if people want a tool, like, I would suggest just like Ali Hunter and just scrolling on there. Yeah. Ali Hunter is actually a really nice soul. Uh, a friend of mine showed it to me. Uh, I actually was, it wasn't even a friend of mine. It was like a random guy to call with 
he wanted to give me some value so he just showed it and i was like okay this is cool and like you're able to see the sales from from uh from a shopify store like live sales then based on like live sales you can kind of see if it was a minute ago or maybe five minutes ago it could be scaling if you check the store later again like you see you see them selling again they could they could be scaling versus if it's like you know three days ago you know they're not they're not generating any sales uh and, and it's not a winner um so so yeah i mean like uh, you, you uh, back to back to kind of like ecom incubator you're working with over what is it, like uh, around 1800 people uh, there's uh, yeah there's like a decent amount of people in like across like the the ecom incubator i guess like e ecosystem in a way um yeah but like in my main program there's about like 250 plus people and um yeah, I have access to like some of their ad accounts and I get to see what they're doing and stuff. If you run an e-commerce store and you're looking to generate more revenue with email and SMS marketing, go to agencygr.com slash call to book in a free call with us. It's agency, J as in Jacob, R as in Rainus, dot com slash call. And let's talk to see if and how we can help. So let's pretend no one's listening. Uh, none of them are listening what what are kind of like the biggest platforms you see people spending on are, are there any trends you're seeing like for, for dropshipping obviously tiktok right now is a huge huge market like do you see more and more people just trying to get away from facebook to tiktok what are you seeing in terms of like media buying trends definitely there is like a trend to like tiktok just like naturally that would happen in, in the space and just like with any kind of trend towards tiktok and like they're killing it on tiktok there's people killing it on facebook for me, like I, I'm honestly like a Facebook guy and or like I'm just like a marketer. I'm, I'm just wherever like my audience is and I adapt accordingly to it. And then also utilizing like Omnichannel for like the actual brands I'm working with that I plan to like blow up to like half a million a month. I'm more so not I'm always thinking Omnichannel, not only with like direct response, but also also like the content marketing side. So like you engage my business i'm gonna not only get them on like other platforms with like youtube ads and stuff but like with just like direct response ads but like just peer to content marketing ads or like content marketing has been something i've been layering um with like everything i run right so like you know, off topic right so, no but but i think it's an interesting topic because a friend of mine they had run a um a sales agency um, so they've worked with Ty Lopez and whatnot, and everyone who runs info, they scale on YouTube, but we're not seeing that many people scale on YouTube with, with, uh, with, uh, uh, physical products. So like when you mention YouTube, are those like YouTube ads specifically, or, or is that, or is that, for example, just organic creatives you try to blow up? Um, I, I'm not using it to scale like the physical products. I'm using it more so just for like the content marketing side of things. Awareness, basically. Yeah, awareness. Um, more so like retargeting mm -hmm. like i'm gotcha. also like it's not like just random content that i'm throwing up on youtube i'm just retargeting them with like okay like before mm -hmm. and afters or like customer reveals and stuff so that i mean it costs like pennies to like get someone to engage with their business through youtube ads so then like if it takes like i don't know seven times for a person to see your business to like trust you to buy something especially if they're interested doing that on youtube nine cents i think i think like it, for me i've seen it to be like cut my costs in half yeah 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 interesting and right i mean like right now a huge a huge problem we see people have is attribution um like like how do you deal with that right now post ios 14 are you using utms is it triple whale high rows like what are you using in terms of that or are you actually using any tool I, I'm definitely using um a tool because the tracking is like horrendous. So um I'm using Hyros and like for most stuff, try triple whale. Honestly, I, I just really like Hyros because of the uh the UI and everything. Like it just it feels more seamless for me, less confusing compared to the uh the other the other tracking softwares. Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. We, we, with, with a lot of the clients we work with, we use, we use high rows. I know a lot of people use triple well. I, I want, I, I personally I haven't been in the UI yet. I want to see how it is. Uh, but high rows is definitely, definitely a, a good, good tool. Uh, we actually teach email tracking there, which is, which yeah, that's is, all. Uh, I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, 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 like, yeah. It's like fucked up still. Like, even with like high rows and everything, like a lot of things are properly attributed. 
and it's like kind of kind of annoying but luckily like just like the way i run ads and everything it's like super simple like like three campaigns and yeah but i i don't know like the track stuff is like quite kind of kind of kind of annoying i had like another question to kind of get back to your students you have like a pretty decent sample size you see what people are spending on you see what you're doing on i'm curious about like uh what what are the characteristics or things some of your students do that make them succeed faster? Is it maybe their speed of application, maybe how, how hard or how speedy they are with their work? Or is it more pure luck? Like what you just say, like what makes someone succeed faster in, in the e-commerce? I, I like that question. I, I would say like luck is always involved in some form, but like to get lucky, it's like massive amounts of like, it, it's literally just speed. People think it's like, or, or like they get caught up and like, okay, should I test like these two, five offers? Like which offers should I test? I'm like, test all of them within the same week. Or they're like, okay, like they've been stuck on like this product or like creating the greatest or like weeks. I'm like, dude, you should have been finished that in a day. And I'm not even just saying that because like I've been doing this for a while, but it's like the fact that we've literally been doing this like fast since the start. And that's how like we progress rapidly. So basically speed of execution and trial and trial and error. I think it's basically the same with like any kind of business. The more you test, the more you know, the better you perform. So yeah, thanks for the input. Maybe is there something like a secondary thing you've noticed or is just like speed of execution is like the first one by far and the rest is like not so important. I would say speed of execution, like it, it almost comes down to like a, an identity thing as well. I would say like, yeah, really the person, like if they have like a great mindset and it's like so cheesy, it's like everyone always says is like the mindset is everything, but it's literally everything. Cause like, if you have a great mindset, wherever you're placed, like you're going to figure out a way every single time, especially if like, you're a quick learner and like you're creative, like it's, it's going to work out as long as you just execute and you're, you're patient about it. But that's like the main thing I've noticed. And yeah, you, people that are just really curious, like the extreme curiosity is, and the ability to reverse engineer and just execute and like finding like a balance, like, yeah, reverse engineer, execute. And then you got to find like a balance between like caring and not caring. Cause if you care too much, you're a perfectionist. If you don't care enough, then your quality of work sucks. So like figuring out that balance where you're at, where you care enough. So you're doing like conscious work, conscious research, and then where you don't care enough so that you're just actually just doing the work. Yeah, maybe maybe like you, you've gone through different revenue levels from starting out six figures, seven figures, eight figures. What we did another podcast with with uh, uh, Ron from Obvi, uh, and we asked this question again. I think it's a very interesting question to see different people's perspectives. One thing we've noticed ourselves is like as you get from kind of like one revenue step to the next one, things change. So for you, what were kind of like maybe different mindset shifts, different, like new skills you need to learn or kind of um, uh, ways you need to involve in to go from like starting to six figures, then seven and then eight. Um, scale Josh and me business seven figures. And then I'll just like scale it. Cause like, I don't know, I just like to push the limits. So we scale to like eight figures. Um, but obviously that's extremely fast growth. And especially if, if you're operating your business, like, Josh and Bismol, like you're gonna have like a shit ton of complaints. Like it's kind of not sustainable. I, I guess like at, at least like the team, like I barely had a team anyways to sustain that scale. It was literally just me and like a team of VAs. And as long as they had like customer service and I was able to outpace like all the complaints and everything, like and I was getting paid in processing, I could just scale, right? Um fuck you, sorry. Okay, you repeat the question because uh, so yeah. my mom gets like everywhere sometimes. No worries, no worries. So, so like kind of uh, there, like from what we've seen, it's when you scale, when you go from one revenue level to the next one, you need to change as a, as a person. So, what are kind of like typical like new skills you need to learn, mindset shifts you need to 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 learn uh, to make to go from six figure like from zero six figures from six to seven seven to eight. That that question honestly for me is like I got. I want to say like, I got no clue, but, but like I, I've done it, but like, I, I got no clue at the same time. Cause I don't know, maybe I haven't reflected on it like right. for myself, 
you have just been hustling and just 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 scaling as fast as possible. I I, I kind of feel you with that because I, like initially um uh I, I was the same way, but like then uh like I, one day I kind of like stepped back and I look at kind of like what we've done so far with Jacob. And I was like, huh, what did we actually do to get that to get here? And it was kind of like interesting to see like like what we did and like kind of like with for us. With every with every step, uh, we need to evolve. It's also different because we have different business models as well, right? So we run an agency. You you're doing you're doing uh, dropshipping. Scalability is different as well. Like 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 for example, with you with dropshipping and whatnot, you can scale a lot further uh, as as kind of like a uh, like you know a team maybe like a team of Navy SEALs. Like um, one of my friend told me, um, uh, Oriol, uh, maybe you know him. He's from Spain. Uh, he told me a, a story of like three French guys. They primarily work with influencers. They're very low key. They don't really appear on social media and whatnot. And they were doing promotions with with uh, Kylie. Uh, was it Kim Kardashian and Kylie Jenner? I think it was Kylie Jenner for Black for Black Friday. Um, and it was just three guys. They were they were stressing about stock. Like they had agreements where like literally it was they were obligated to ship out the product to someone's house within two days. Like if you don't do Jeez. that, like you know, you you're gonna get like sued and whatnot. They were like, they, he said, like he was getting like red bumps all over his stomach from the stress they were through. Wow. Yeah, but but they scaled. They scaled super super far. I think it was like 400k in a day, wow. uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and and uh, yeah, I mean, like like with ecom, you can go very very far with like with like a couple of people who are very very skilled, uh, and then kind of like higher around that if you if you if you yeah, just just. Uh, uh, if you need to. One question I know, I, I hear this in, in Tim Ferriss' podcast, and I think it's an interesting, interesting question to ask. Um, if you could put a huge billboard in New York Times Square, what would it say? Like, like you have endless opportunities. What, what's the message you would say? I would say, I want to say, listen and, and to your gut and speak, speak whatever you, yeah, speak whatever is on your mind. Or mm. something like that that's yeah to, to go back to back to this uh i recently discovered cobra tate i hadn't listened to any of this content i saw a bunch of people posting him so i was like okay i'm gonna check it out one thing i really respect about him is like it like it might not be legit but i feel like he talks about like truly what he believes in and and, and that's something you don't see a lot of people do especially these days especially with cancel culture uh, the risk around that. So, so uh, yeah, be, being, being, being uh, honest and, and speaking your mind is important these days. So, yeah. Uh, anyways, Brandon, if people want to join Ecom Incubator, if people want to find you on social media, firstly, where can they find you? Uh, they can find me at Yengub on uh, Instagram, YouTube, yeah, uh, t- Twitter. Twitter was it was it uh, Yengub or was it uh, real it's Yengub? Real, real Yengub. Real Yengub. Somebody yeah. Somebody took Yengub, right? Yeah, somebody <laughs> took Yengub. Did they try to sell it back to you? No, I, I, I think I think I took it and then I just <laughs> got banned somehow. So I'm just like, same uh, with Jacob. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, 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 cool. And and, and e- Ecom Incubator, uh, maybe before we kind of like dive into the end of the podcast, can you tell tell the people who might be interested in that, like maybe learn a bit from, from you, from Jim? Uh, yeah, can you can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, they want to learn about like Ecom Incubator. It's basically a program for like people that are starting out or want to start, people that are struggling. Um, basically, me and Jim practice what we preach. We get to see like, I mean, you get to see a shit ton of ad accounts. I get to see shit on my accounts. We practice what we preach. So I guess that's like the big difference between um, us and all the other programs. Um, but like they can find us literally just on my Instagram and our link trees. And we got like a bunch of stuff, like the free Facebook group and stuff, um, Discord group. And like, we got like some programs, but I mean, people just join our free, free Facebook group stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Free value, why not? You, you can join and meet, meet a lot of like-minded individuals. Uh, sometimes you might even be able to find your business partners. Uh, that's uh, literally how I found uh, Eric, the gem and everyone that uh, I'm currently working with. Oh, actually, uh, that, b- before I maybe wrap up, this could be an inter- interesting, interesting uh, question. Like, yeah, how, how, how did you meet Jim and how did you connect? How did you even decide to partner up? Um, so I, I met Jim in like a Discord server. Like, like how, how do you guys meet him? Um, 
he got Kiev. And before that, there was, a, there was an interesting, uh, we were, like Parsa was running a store. We were running, we were doing the emails. We didn't talk to Gem at all. Um, long story short, it was, uh, I, I, I don't really know what happened. Uh, it wasn't a good experience at first. Like me and Jim, we, we talked about it. Uh, but then we met, met a geek out Kiev and, and connected. Uh, that, that, that was a pretty cool experience. I think that, that could be like, we're going to get Jim on a podcast. It could be an interesting topic to talk about. I think it's a, <laughs> uh, 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 um, like, yeah, not, not so much a funny topic, but, but it's interesting. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, like, look, it's, it's, it's still the e-com community. It's kind of, it was kind of uh, through uh, Julian. Uh, we brought him on a podcast as well. First ever podcast with, was with Julian. He talked Pinterest ads. Yeah, uh, we, we talked we talk with him about it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it really was Geek Out. And now we're going to Geek Out Miami. We met up in Geek Out Kiev as well. Uh, amazing Dubai. events. Amazing Dubai. events. Geek Out Dubai. Yeah. The, oh, the, yeah. The what they say? Big, but said... small at the same time. It's like super interconnected. It's yeah. like... It's like you, you would think it's big, but like actually everyone knows each other and it's kind of kind of, kind of funny that way. Yeah, 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 for sure. For sure. Um, all right. So so I think I think uh, we can wrap up the episode on this note. It's been a pleasure uh, talking with you, Brandon. Um, yeah. And, and uh, that's pretty much it. You know where to find him. Yangab on IG, real Yangab on Twitter, ecom-incubator.com if you want to if you want to learn more about and, you know, uh, learn from Brandon. Uh, that's pretty much what we have for this episode. Thank you for watching and bye. If you thought this episode is valuable, share it with a friend that may find this useful and leave a five-star review so we can reach more influential people and bring the lessons back to you. See you in the next episode.